Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's union lectures. My name is Harald Chu. I'm president of the IAG, International Association of Geodesy. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, Professor Kosuke Heki. Professor Heki got a PhD in geophysics in 1984. In 1994, he became associate professor in the Earth Rotation Division at the National Astronomical Observatory, Japan. And in 2004, again, 10 years later, he became a full professor at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Hokkaido University in Sapporo. His research is in space geodesy and in the applications of space geodesy in Earth and planetary uh, sciences. And uh, I haven't seen uh, the talk that he's going to give today, but from previous talks, I know he's using a lot of cartoons and animations. So uh, I guess there will be a lot of fun <laughs> in his lecture about the topic is geodesy sharpens you up. And the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk in front of such uh, many people. Uh, I decided on uh, this title when I was eating uh, this candy. So no uh, important reason. Okay. And this is essentially a message from a geodesist to geophysicist. OK, so what is geodesy? So maybe everybody knows. And uh, uh, this is a simple uh, picture. So this is a map before geodesy, the Japanese version. Okay, and after geodesy, so you can see the difference. And there are many versions in for different countries, I think. And this is, uh, in geodesy, we also study uh, geoid and the gravity, and the shape of the Earth and the rotation of the Earth. And uh, before geodesy, we knew uh, the Earth is a sphere, and then we found uh, equatorial bulge. And after space geodesy, it's very complicated. And now we even know that it is, uh, it changes in time, like this. OK. So I want to ask one uh, question. So we are attending IUGG, uh, GG standing for uh, geodesy and geophysics. Okay. So this is from Wikipedia. So this sounds uh, a bit strange. So only IAG is representing the first one, and uh, uh, geophysics are rep is <laughs> represented by seven uh, associations. So this looks like a <laughs> so <laughs> Thank you. So please, I, I wish you are not offended by uh, this. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask uh, geodesy uh, if it deserves the treatment like this. Okay. So uh, geophysics are uh, studying the Earth, uh, various parts of the Earth. And uh, I'm going to review uh, the link between geodesy and uh, these different fields of uh, geophysics. Uh, one by one. Okay, and now it is uh, the world version of before geodesy and uh, our well after geodesy, and after space geodesy. So now we have uh, uh, velocity vectors of uh, the surface of the Earth. So this. Arrows represent the velocity uh, of GNSS stations. And uh, uh, space geodesy era started in 1980s, and I was working on uh, this technique called uh, VLBI. And uh, we use huge telescopes to 
receive signals from distant radio sources. Then, for example, uh, these two uh, figures represent the right hand one is a uh, baseline within a plate, and the left hand one is a uh, baseline across a plate boundary. So the first one doesn't change, and the second one does change. So this is the first one of the uh, uh, earliest uh, detections of plate uh, movement of plates. Okay, and nowadays uh, we have a lot of uh, satellites uh, in addition to quasars. And the signal from the satellite is large enough and uh, we don't need large dish and just a small antenna and receiver is enough. And uh, ground facility is so cheap, so just exploded in numbers. And this red dot is uh, G permanent GNSS stations in Japan. And uh, as the last of my talk, I'm going to say that this is not dense at all, but this looks dense. So we can see the movement of uh, a station, or we can al analyze the cluster deformation of an island arc. So this is before space geodesy, and after space geodesy, we have a. So this is a cluster movement by the 2011 uh, Tohokoki earthquake. So cluster deformation, uh, this helps study of earthquakes and volcanoes. And this is too straightforward and what everyone knows. So I do not uh, spend much time uh, on this. Uh, rather, I, I want to emphasize uh, GNSS is also useful uh, for measuring the atmosphere. For example, uh, water vapor in the lower troposphere and uh, electron in uh, ionosphere, so they uh, can be measured as a dispersive and non-dispersive uh, delays of the microwave from satellites. And this is uh, useful for space sciences and atmospheric sciences, okay? And satellites also are increasing in space, and uh, maybe you know uh, GPS and GLONASS, Beidou and Galileo, and I want to introduce a Japanese system, QZSS. So most of these uh, satellites have 12 hours of uh, orbital uh, period. So it moves in the sky. So when we measure the number of electrons, uh, it is a kind of mixture of the temporal change and spatial change and uh, elevation change. So it's not easy to interpret. However, if we use uh, this system, uh, this is composed of three uh, quasi-Zenith orbit satellites and one geostationary orbit satellite. So this is geostationary. Then uh, it is fixed to uh, the rotating Earth. And uh, quasi-Zenith is somewhat different. And uh, the ground track shows uh, eight uh, character uh, shape, and it stays near the zenith in the mid-latitude uh, region, like Japan, uh, for about eight hours. So we have a system that uh, either one of the just uh, quasi zenith satellite is up uh, near the zenith above Japan, and one is always in the uh, geostationary form, uh, orbit. So with this, uh, for example, we can draw a very beautiful uh, figure of, in this case, I'm showing the uh, medium scale traveling ionic disturbance. And that is because the satellite doesn't move in the sky. So we can monitor a single point in ionosphere uh, using the same co combination of the satellite and station, uh, 24 hours all the year round. So this is very useful for ionospheric studies. Okay, so we can isolate temporal changes. And this is one example of 24 hours continuous uh, record of total electron content. And uh, there is one important uh, signal here. Uh, here occurred uh, a launch of a rocket from Japan. 
And if the, this happens, then uh, it makes uh, a hole in an ionosphere. Okay, so this occurred uh, in October last year. And you can see uh, the launch pad is in the small island south of Kyushu, and it penetrated the F region of ionosphere uh, far uh, to the south of Japan. And you can see the birth and growth of ionospheric hole. And because we can uh, monitor uh, one particular point uh, continuously, so we can track from the beginning of the start of the hole until the natural decay of uh, this hole. So this is quite useful for ionospheric studies. Okay, then uh, water vapor. So far, uh, we use, uh, for example, radio zone. So this is uh, typically uh, twice a day, so every 12 hours. And uh, uh, unlike the uh, total relaxing content, we have to estimate uh, Zenith total delay as a parameter together with other parameters. So we have to look uh, many different uh, radio sources. And this is uh, assuming that the mapping function is only a function of elevation. And often we also introduce uh, azimuthal asymmetry called uh, delay gradient. Uh, it is a vector and showing the direction of more uh, water vapor. Okay, so this is hourly uh, plot of the atmospheric delay above the Japanese islands. And uh, so we have 11 stations of uh, radio zone. And you can see that it is uh, not adequate from both uh, spatial and temporal point of view. Okay, and this is a snapshot at a certain time. And this is in July. And I plot also the gradient vector. So now you can see that similar uh, arrows uh, beautifully line up along a certain line. So this is a front, atmospheric front. So nowadays, uh, it's always raining in Japan. So it is because of uh, this stationary front. So it is collision of the warm air and cold air. So it's just like this. And uh, the cold front, it's a kind of a subduction of a cold air mass into a warm air mass. So this looks like a subduction of cold lithosphere into hot asthenosphere. Okay, and re let us see that uh, how stationary is uh, such a subduction from space geodetic data. Okay, so this is a uh, movement of a certain station in Hawaii because of the movement of the Pacific plate. So compared with uh, our data back in 1980s, so this is a great advance of space, uh, space geodesy technique. And if we, we can take out just one year, so we could uh, obtain, for example, monthly velocity of uh, the plate. Okay, and there are uh, many such stations and I want to show you something interesting. And the velocity of the plate is determined by the balance of the force acting on the slab. And if there's a large earthquake, uh, the interplate coupling will disappear and may change uh, slightly the velocity of uh, the oceanic plate. Okay, so let's look at the movement of Diego Garcia in Indian Ocean after 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake and the uh, uh, change of the Hawaiian station after the Tohoku earthquake. Okay, so this is the component parallel with the plate motion, okay? And this is a uh, component perpendicular to the plate motion. So this was an earthquake. And I want to uh, remove the trend. Now you can see that there's a change in the velocity. So there are many different ways of uh, interpreting this. So this could be just a, 
uh, viscous relaxation of upper mantle or whatsoever. Uh, okay, so this is a case in Hawaii. So it's difficult to see the change. However, there might be a change. So this may become significant in 20 years. So let me report it in the IUGG 2039, <laughs> not now. Okay, and if it is possible to do uh, such a, uh, observations uh, under the sea, uh, it, is, it is a fun. However, it is not easy, so we have to use acoustic wave to link the something on the sea surface and something at the bottom of the ocean. And I already showed this, and this include a certain amount of uh, submarine uh, geodetic benchmarks. So this became very popular uh, So since, say, 15 years ago in Japan. And there are some also uh, stations in uh, southwestern Japan showing the interseismic cluster movement. Okay, so gravity and geoid. Okay, this is a kind of masterpiece. Uh, it's a view of Delft, but for a geodesist, it looks like a geoid in Delft because this canal is connected to the ocean, right? And he has another masterpiece for geodesy. So it's a gravity in Delft. So the gravity and geoid are so always perpendicular, okay? So what is the space age uh, gravimetry? Uh, this is a very rather cheap uh, gravimeter. And if you carry this in space station, we cannot use, so this doesn't work. So instead, we analyze the movement of the satellite itself. And one way is to launch uh, two satellites and measure uh, the distance between the two satellites. So this is the row and row uh, satellite to satellite tracking. Okay, so this is just like about 200 kilometer uh, separated and 500 kilometer above uh, the Earth. Okay, so this is the geoid height. Uh, using drone, using the uh, GRACE data. And uh, using the same set, you can also draw a picture of uh, the gravity anomaly. Okay, so they are different face of the same thing. And now we have a photo on of GRACE uh, since last year, and there are many talks on this topic in this IUGG meeting. So this is uh, average seasonal change of the gravity. So this is very small, one over a bili one billionth of the uh, gravity field. So this is reflecting the change in the soil moisture and snowpack. So it is very important for hydrology, okay? And also we can see the uh, secular trend for example, you can see a negative trend in the southernmost part of uh, South America, and it is a decay of the glacier, glacial system in Patagonia. So this is many years ago and recent, so you, you have seen such pictures many times, I think. And this is in Himalaya, and this is many years ago, and recently it's like this. And in Alps, so the two centuries ago, now, but it is not so large, so we cannot see the signal from GRACE. And also we see the increase of gravity, this is GIA, and also uh, earthquake signature too. Okay, so I have talked about many, many different geophysics, and but except one, so what's missing? Okay, so ocean. So this is, the rest one is uh, uh, satellite to determine the geoid uh, precisely. And right hand one is uh, uh, sea surface height measurement with uh, ocean altimetry. 
And if we combine these two, then we can contribute to uh, physical oceanography. Okay. So what is the origin of this uh, angulation of geoid? And if we make a uh, sea mount, then you can make a bump on the geoid. Actually, it is much smaller than the uh, sea mount itself. But this is possible. And another way of making topography on the sea surface is uh, dynamic topography. It is by the current. So if there is a strong current, there's a, uh, there should be a force balance. Then it makes a uh, topography like this and called uh, dynamic topography. So in order to isolate the topography, uh, mean dynamic topography, we have to uh, subtract the geoid contribution from altimetric sea surface height. So this is very important for mapping the geostrophic current. And that is, uh, I showed two cases in the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, uh, Northern Pacific Ocean. So this is for something for physical oceanographer. So this is the movement of a uh, centimeter per second level. And uh, this is meter per day level uh, measurement uh, velocity of the glacier. And we, you, uh, we use a synthetic aperture radar to measure this. Yeah, this is a Japanese satellite. And we transmit radio signal and it bounces back at the ground. Okay, so this is a uh, ground and there's a fault. Okay, it moves like this. And suppose a uh, certain region, and we transmit a signal and it bounces at uh, a certain point, and we repeat the same thing after an earthquake. Then there's a phase change, and we give a certain color. So this tells a very detailed map of uh, cluster deformation. So this is just like having so many uh, GNSS stations on the ground. Okay, so this is an example of the 2016 Kumamoto earthquake. So the colors are coming from uh, synthetic aperture radar. And you can see some uh, black point. They are GNSS point. So Japanese people uh, always say we have a dense network, but this not dense at all. So we definitely need uh, INSA uh, to study this earthquake. Okay, so this is also something for seismology and volcanology. Okay, so uh, geodesy is very versatile, and uh, I didn't talk about all of the contribution, so just a part of them. So if you are interested in uh, uh, geodetic observations, uh, please visit this page. Okay, so this is the answer to the uh, question. <laughs> so geodesy is... Uh, doing more giving than taking. So making other geophysicists uh, happy. So I think no single association is playing the similar role uh, out of the eight associations in uh, IUGG. So this is something special for geodesy. So I think this name is all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and I think I didn't promise too much. <laughs> so I'm sure there are a few questions, and if so, please use one of the microphones. No question, everybody got sharpened up. <laughs> We move on okay. to the next presentation. Thank you very much again. Thank you.